Good morning, church. We are so glad you're here with us this morning. We want to welcome you. We also want to welcome those that are watching online. We appreciate having you there as well. My name is Chris Cope, and I'm a staff here. And again, we are thrilled to have you here in the room. In the pew back in front of you is a connection card. We encourage you to take that, fill that out either the old-fashioned way or there's a QR code attached to that. We would love to have a record of your visit, also be able to pray for any needs. Uh, this morning's communion offering uh, will go to a room at the end. Uh, each week we get the opportunity as a church family to say our vision statement together, so let's do that at this time. Reaching out to transform lives by extending God's love to all. Let's begin this morning with scripture out of Isaiah. In days to come, the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established as the highest of the mountains and shall be raised above the hills. All the nations shall stream to it. Many peoples shall come and say, come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways and that he may walk and that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth instruction and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let's begin with worship. Would you please join me this morning for our call to worship? Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. Each day, God brings to us new opportunities to learn and grow. God is near to all of us. We will not fear to call upon the Lord. Come, let us praise God who walks with us daily. Let us open our hearts and spirits to God who loves and lives with us. Amen. Would you please stand and let's sing when we all get to heaven, let's stand and worship. Sing and 
shout the victory. Let us one be true and faithful, trusting, serving every day. Just one glimpse of him in glory will the toils of life repay when we all get to heaven. What a day of rejoicing that will be. Shout the victory. Onward to the prize before us. Soon his beauty will behold. Soon the pearly gates will open. We shall tread the streets of gold when we all get to heaven. What a day! Rejoicing that will be when we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. At this time, if you will join me in our invitation, confession, and pardon. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Would you please pray in silence? Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. You may be seated.
Good morning, church family. Do you like to play games? This morning we're going to play a game. It's called Things That Go Together. I have several items in my bag. When I pull one out, I want you to tell me what goes with it. Let's see what we have. First, we have peanut butter. What goes with peanut butter? Jelly. That's right. Let's see what else we have. Oh, I have a hammer. What is something that goes with the hammer? You guessed it right. Nails. And of course, I have one more thing. I have salt. So what goes good with salt? Pepper, right? These things naturally go together. When we say that we love Jesus, the Bible tells us that there is something that naturally goes with it. Do you know what it is? The Bible says that if we love Jesus, we will show it by the way we act. Those two things go together like peanut butter and jelly. If we say we love Jesus and then we lie to our parents or we don't do something that we said we were going to do, that doesn't really go together. If we say we love Jesus and then say something mean or hateful to someone, do those go together? No. Show your faith and love for Jesus with your words and actions. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, please be with us throughout the week. Help us to show our love for you through our words and actions. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. At this time, kindergarten through third grade are dismissed to Kids Church. Our fourth and fifth grade are invited to join us as we practice for our Christmas performance in December. Carrieville United Methodist Church. Can you hear me now? All righty. Well, I'm Tondala, one of the pastors here. It is always a blessing to uh, come to worship with you as we worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. On the screens, you will see a list of people who need our prayers. Please include them in your daily prayer life. Many of you have already been praying for the McKinney family. Virginia McKinney service will be at Memorial Park Funeral Home on Wednesday, November the 9th. Visitation is at noon with Celebration of Life service at 1 p.m. Please continue to pray for this family. At this time, I will give you a few moments to pray alone before I lead us in a congregational prayer. Let us pray. Creator God, we give thanks to you today for the blessings you shower on us every day. You have blessed us in numerous ways as we are created in your image. Show us how to do good so that we can be doers of your word and not just hearers, God. Use us, Lord, as you desire and help us to be more attentive to your daily requests which are to love you with all our heart, mind, and soul, and to love our neighbors as ourselves, the two greatest commandments. Loving God, show us how to align our words with our deeds so that they represent you. Encourage us to sincerely seek out opportunities that will allow us to spread your perfect love wherever we go. God, you know, we trust you. We have faith in you, and we love you. Then, Jesus, we want to faithfully give ourselves to you. Give ourselves to you, our Lord and Savior. And may the Holy Spirit guide us in being faithful to our Heavenly Father and our Lord and Savior. Thank you for hearing and answering our prayers, God. And give us the patience that we need as we wait on you to answer them in your time and in your way. 
All of this we pray in the name of your Son, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Would you please stand and let's sing together, immortal, invisible, God only wise, let's stand and worship together. Let us pray for our offering. God of truth and light, we come to you from our daily lives that are full of scams and tricks, seeking to gain our confidence and steal and betray. Jesus has reminded us to trust in you and in your truth that speaks, not through phones or emails, but directly to our hearts. We pray this in the name of Christ, who intercedes for us that we might know the truth. Amen.
remain standing for the reading of the scripture lesson, which is coming from 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace. We always give thanks to God for all of you and mention you in our prayers constantly remembering before our God and Father your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brothers and sisters, beloved by God, that he has chosen you because our message of the gospel came to you not in word only but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction just as you know what kind of persons we proved to be among you for your sake. And you became imitators of us and of the Lord, for in spite of persecution, you received the word with joy inspired by the Holy Spirit, so that you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and in Achaia. For the word of the Lord has sounded forth, from you, not only in Macedonia, Macedonia and Achaia, but in every place your faith in God has become known, so that we have no need to speak about it. For the people of those regions report about us what kind of welcome we had among you and how you turned to God from idols to serve a living and true God. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Church, and we are glad that, let me try that again. Good morning, I'm Eddie Bromley, and uh, one of the pastors here, so glad to have you worshiping with us this morning. Today we're beginning a, a three-week series to finish our fall. It's called The Conspiracy of Kindness. We're going to lay out a little bit of what that means and talk about that for the next couple weeks, and we're inviting you to join in this conspiracy. But the basic premise of the series is that we want people to come to know Jesus. We believe that, that human beings were created to know and enjoy and love and honor God for all of eternity. And we want to live in such a way that our words and our deeds facilitate and help people come to know Jesus rather than hindering it, them and making it more difficult for them to come to know Jesus. So that's the basic premise of the whole series, and it's what I'm going to talk to you about this morning, about our words and our deeds being in sync so that our lives help people to come to know Jesus rather than hindering them. And, and so this morning, I just want to start by talking about the importance uh, of our words and our deeds. And so it, it's not enough for our deed or for our words to be right if our deeds are undermining our words. So if our lives, if our example is, is out of sync with our words, then our words are going to be more hurtful or more uh, unhelpful than helpful. So Paul says 
the, the, the scripture that we read this morning, that the people of Thessalonia came to know Jesus because their message came not only with words, but with power. In other words, their example, their living faith, it, it cohered with their words in such a way that it convinced these folks that Jesus Christ really is who these messengers of, of Christ say He is. And so, this morning I want to say to you that, that our, our words are not enough. Imagine, rather than having a beautiful fall day that we're having, Imagine that we were having one of our stormy mornings. We've had some of those, right? And imagine that one of you, because the sermon was so boring, was uh, maybe on your, on your phone instead of paying attention to the guy up front. I mean, that, that's hypothetically possible. And, and imagine that you were looking at the Weather Channel and saw that a tornado was bearing down on us. And you were to come up and, and, and get up in front of me and, 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 and say, hey, folks, tornado's coming. But you said that as you were giggling and sort of swaying back and forth. We would hear you, but we might not be able to connect your words with the intent, right? So, so sometimes we say the right things, but our example isn't there to follow it. Now, just, just as, uh, as difficult as it is when our words don't follow, aren't followed by our deeds, sometimes our deeds aren't enough to explain what we're pointing towards without words. So, um, Matt McCulloughtoss has a book called Good News for Change, and he came up with this example, so I don't want to pretend like I came up with this all by myself. But imagine that we were going to give you a task. We were going to turn over a first-grade classroom to you tomorrow. And uh, some of you do that for a living, so you're going to have to come up with your own example. But for those of you that are not first-grade teachers, imagine that we were turning over a first-grade class tomorrow to you, and your only task was to help these kids know who George Washington is. Now, we're going to add one more curveball. These are all first-generation immigrant kids, and they've never heard of George Washington before. Now imagine if you just tried by your example to teach them. You, you weren't going to overdo it, so you're not going to actually say anything verbally, but you're hoping that your example will tell them who George Washington is. Now how patriotic would you have to behave in order for these kids to understand that uh, George Washington lived in Mount Vernon, Virginia? Uh, what, what would you have to do? How, how red, white, and blue would you have to be uh, to help them understand that he was put in charge of the Continental Army? What if you wore, you know, breeches that came up to here with socks and a powdered wig and a wool coat? Would, would they understand that George Washington was twice uh, chosen unanimously to be President of the United States and that he stepped down voluntarily? rather than becoming king, in order for the peaceful transfer of power. If you only acted the part but didn't give them the compelling words, if you didn't tell them what your, what your behavior was about, they might think it was interesting that you were dressed up that way. They might think that it was an extension of Halloween, but they wouldn't understand and be able to connect your behavior with the intent that your behavior was wanting to point towards. So let me give you two examples of, of each of those from my own personal life. So you know, or some of you know, that I grew up in a non-religious home. I grew up, in, a, in fact, in a family that was antagonistic to Christianity. And, uh, and so I didn't have an easy on-ramp to following Jesus. Yet I had two uh, examples, one of words and one of deeds, but, but without one another, uh, that, that didn't help me much. So for example, I worked in a restaurant uh, during high school as a waiter. Now, I'm going to give you just one guess. What was the worst day to be a waiter in a restaurant? What is it? Sunday. It sure was. I and all the wait waiting staff hated Sunday. They were, they were the most demanding folks. They were the hardest to please. They, they were the cheapest. Uh, and... and I'll tell you, their behavior didn't help me understand about Jesus. But they said things about Jesus. Sometimes they asked me why I wasn't in church. Because I wanted to keep my job, I didn't say what my answer was. But I wanted to say it's because you're here. I can't be in church. Somebody has to be here to wait on you. Sometimes instead of a tip, 
they would leave pamphlets about Jesus. And again, because I wanted to keep my job, what, what I was thinking in my head is, I wonder what you would do if at the end of your work week, if instead of your paycheck, they gave you religious material. <laughs> On the other hand, I, I had a good example in my grandparents. Despite my parents being anti-religious, my grandparents went to church. They went to a Methodist church. You might say, aha, that's it. But it's not. It's not. My grandparents, for whatever reason, maybe it was not to offend my parents, I don't really know, but they never told me about Jesus. I, I was vaguely aware that they went to church, but, uh, but, but they never really told us why. And so I was never able to really put the, the behaviors together, even though I loved and respected my grandparents, and I probably would have been most receptive uh, by, of, of, of the gospel by hearing it from them, they never took uh, the opportunity to tell me. And so how I became a Christian, or at least in part, was because thankfully God did put somebody in my life whose words and deeds went together. His name was Tim, and Tim is still one of my dearest friends to this day. He would occasionally tell me about Jesus, and he loved and respected me. So, so his deeds and his words went together. Now, it took seven years of friendship for that to eventually penetrate my heart, but it was because in him both of the two things were together that I eventually came to know Jesus. Now, let me say something else about words. The other thing about words is that they have to be understandable. They have to be understood by the target audience. And what happens, and, and it's already happened to me because I've been in the church for like 30 years now, is I speak kind of Bibleese. I speak Christian jargon, and that's not always clear to people who are non-religious. And so, for example, we say, you know, we want people to know Jesus as Lord. And, and you and I understand that because we have a lot of Bible knowledge, right? We know what that means. But most church, non-church people don't understand that, okay? So, uh, let me tell you, when we say Jesus is Lord, we mean two things. One is we mean we're identifying Him with God in some way. So, rather than saying the personal name of Yahweh in the Old Testament, the most common way of referring to God is by saying Lord. And so, when we call Jesus Lord, we're, we're, we're making a link between Him and God. Now, that's easy for us to understand, but probably to a non-churchgoer, the best thing to say is when we look at Jesus, we understand who God is. The other thing we mean when we say Jesus is Lord is that He's in charge of our life. But again, non-church people probably don't understand that because Lord's not a real common, commonly used word in American English. If you're British, you at least have the house of the Lords, but what do we have in America? We, well, if you pay rent, you have a landlord. If you're a science fiction or fantasy buff, you have Lord Vader and Lord Voldemort. Not sure that's helpful. Uh, and if, you're, if, you're, if you're a theater fan, you have Lord of the Dance. Again, I'm not sure that's helpful. Uh, Deborah, a few weeks ago, gave us a really easy way to understand it. If, if Jesus is your Lord, your life's under new management, right? means that our, our life is now being directed by someone else who loves us, who created us, who knows us best, and has our best interest in mind. So this morning, we want to invite you into a conspiracy of kindness. And, and at the benediction, we're going to say just a little more. But for now, we're going to prepare to come to the Lord's table. And I want to lead us in prayer. Gracious and loving God, we want to be the kind of people whose words and example fit like a hand in glove that they're consistent with one another, and that our lives are coherent and compelling so that others may see in us something different, and that they might know you, Lord Jesus Christ, and the one true God whom you came to, uh, to help us know. We give you thanks and praise. Amen. Thank you, Reverend Bromley, for that message today on the conspiracy of kindness. At this time, let us prepare our hearts and mind for the service of word and table.
May the Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts to the Lord. Let us give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should always sing of your glory, Holy Father, almighty and eternal God, through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. For you are the hope of the nations, the builder of the city that is to come. Your love made visible in Jesus Christ brings to home the lost, restores the sinner, and gives dignity to the despised. In his face, your light shines out, flooding lives with goodness and truth, gathering into one in your kingdom a divided and broken humanity. And so with your people on earth and with all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is Jesus Christ, who called you Abba, Father. As a mother tenderly gathers her children, you embrace a people as your own and fill them with longing for a peace that would encompass the world and a justice that would set all things right throughout creation. By your spirit, Jesus came to embody that peace and justice and to set in motion the fulfillment of your reign. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood, by your Spirit. Make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. The table is set. All are welcome to feast at the Lord's table. Will those who will be assisting to serve the Lord's Supper, will you please come forward? You want to do communion first? No. Okay. Don't be scared, sir.
we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us. Grant that we may go into the world in the strength of your Spirit to give ourselves to others. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. This morning, as our invitation, we will be singing Trust and Obey. As we stand, let us hear what the Spirit is saying to us this morning. If you'd like to join the church or if you'd like to pray with one of the pastors, we would be glad to do that this morning. Let us stand and sing. This morning, uh, you were given a card, a Conspiracy of Kindness card. It has a QR code there. It also has a link on our website. If you go to it or you scan that QR code, you're going to get a list of 101 ideas for random acts of kindness. And what we're going to challenge you to do over the month of November is do one of those each week. Uh, and if you want to put that on your, if you want to use the hashtag or our card on, uh, on social media, you can help get out the word, invite others to be a part of it. If everyone in our church each week, including those online, did one act of kindness, we could do 3,000 acts of kindness in, in, in about a month's time. Imagine what an impact that might make and what kinds of uh, on-ramps it might provide for others to come to know Jesus. Now, we know from our survey, there are about 13 of you that don't do social media or, or electronic of any kind. So if you call me this week, I, I will print you a copy of that list. Friends, receive this benediction. Nothing is more practical than finding God. 
than falling in love in quite an absolute and final way. What are you in love with? What seizes your imagination will affect everything. It will decide what gets you out of bed in the mornings, what you do with your evenings, how you spend your weekends, what you read, whom you know, what breaks your heart, and what amazes you with joy and gratitude. Fall in love. Stay in love with God, and it will decide everything. Go in the blessings of God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Oh.